guys, it's Jen from Dizzy Quilter, and I am here today to teach you how to make one of my favorite, favorite hand stitching projects. I love making Kiwandi style quilts. So if you haven't heard of Kiwandi style quilting, Kiwandi are Indian quilts uh, with a city ba African background. Um, <clears throat> they're made from, made by immigrants from Africa to India, and they are made backwards. They are handmade. Um, from the outside in. The tops are not pieced at all. This one's hard to see because it's all white on white. Um, it looks more like this. The tops are not pieced. We're going to layer our pieces in place and then quilt the whole thing together. It's so much fun, so relaxing, perfect for zen stitching if that's what you're into. Um, so we're going to gather our things. We're just going to make a 12 inch block today because we only have 30 minutes to learn. Um, but hopefully you will get the just of it and you will love Kawandi quilting. If you want more from me, I'm dizzyquilter.com and I have classes and tutorials and all kinds of lessons and lots and lots of Kawandi pictures to share. Okay, step one of Kawandi making or Kawandi style quilting making. We're not, oh, well, I'm not Indian, so I don't make actual Kawandi. I make Kawandi style quilts. We're gonna get a 12 inch block of our favorite batting. My favorite batting, my real favorite batting is um, Hobbs Cotton Wool Blend. It's fantastic. My second favorite batting is the scrap that is closest to me when I'm getting ready to start. I have a lot of scraps because I have a uh, long arm machine. And I used to do it for customers, so there's lots of piles of scraps. Uh, anyway, start with your 12 inch square and put it onto a piece of fabric for your backing that is at least one inch larger all the way around and trim it. And if uh, trimming it to one inch seems like not enough, it's okay to go further and have a wider margin. Really doesn't matter that much, but I like to keep it close to an inch. Uh, it doesn't have to be done with a rotary cutter either. It's just easier for me. So there we've got our background. I am going to trim off my selvage. Um, doesn't really matter on this kind of fabric. This is peppered cotton, but a lot of times selvage, when you have a long piece of selvage in your quilt and you wash it, it can shrink at a different rate because the, um, here I can show you on this one, especially on print fabrics, but the warp threads that they use to start the fabric can be a little bit of a different weight or thickness. And when you wash them, they might shrink differently so your quilt can dry in. So I don't like to leave selvage in, in a long piece um, on my quilt. The next step is we're gonna take this over. Well, I'm gonna iron it, I'm not gonna do it on camera. We're gonna fold this edge over <clears throat> right up along the batting and then we're gonna press it and we're gonna do all four sides. Okay. Here's my base all ready to go. And you can see I've just folded over my edges and given the whole thing a nice little press. And the pressing is enough to make the cotton batting stick to the cotton fabric so things don't shift around when we work. If you're making a bigger piece, you are gonna wanna use a few safety pins scattered around um, to prevent the batting from shifting too much. Uh, but this is what our edge is gonna look like. And it's kind of like a knife edge. So you can see here my backing is folded around and it kind of contains my batting and then there's my top edge. And if we wanna take a closer look at this, this little piece, you'll notice that all of the pieces, all of the seams are, or the, you know, the edges are folded under so that there's not gonna be any raw edges on the piece. I don't usually leave raw edges. I do sometimes use a selvage and let a selvage on an Essex linen in particular be exposed because they're pretty sturdy, they don't unravel, and look at how pretty they are. They're always a different contrasting thread. Um, so I like using those, but for the most part, selvages don't get used in my pieces. Uh, they're just a little stiffer. All right, so you can see this one. I've got a bunch of little ones. So this is what we're looking for. So this one, actually, there is a selvage exposed here, I think. Um, but look, it's so clean that it didn't really matter. And it's a small piece. And these little tiny pieces that I make, they, they um, it's fun to use those and leave them in there. Uh, one other thing, there's two elements of Kawandi making 
that you should, or a couple that you should know about. So there are little decorative pieces you can put on. So most of the pieces in this are structural. They're covering up batting, they're making the top. These pieces are decorative, the little colors. It's really easy to see on this piece. They're called tigli, and you just do the same thing that I'm gonna show you with everything else, but you do it wherever you want to scatter some colors around. So if you were using some big scraps, like this one here was pretty big and boring, I put the color over it, just kind of activated the space a little bit, made it more interesting to look at. Um, the center of your kawandi, I don't usually do it the right way, is called a belly, and it's the last piece that you put on, and that's the belly of it, and they call it a belly for um, two reasons. First, sometimes if, when you're making a large one, all the pieces shifting make a little bit of bulk there, so it looks like a little pot belly. And also, it is traditional to put in a couple of grains of rice or some um, seasonings in there just to wish a uh, bountiful harvest on the recipient of the quilt, or actually to wish them a full belly. So that is something I don't usually, uh, I have never put food inside of one of my quilts. I think it's a charming tradition that I don't do. Um, and the last thing are the fula. So these are little decorative elements that you apply to each corner. Um, and they are prairie points, which are, you know, a square folded in half twice on a diagonal and then sewn in so that the raw edges are left to fray. You'll notice that most of my pieces do not have the fula. This is one that I did in a class. I don't care for them. Um, I'm a little bit too uptight. The little dangly things make me unhappy. If you like them, add them. If you don't like them, don't. You're making your own kawandi. It gets to be what you want it to be. All right, let's get started with our kawandi. Uh, step one, thread your needle. I've got a length of thread. I often go with almost 36 inches. Um, that is not what you should do. Use the right length for you. I don't have any problem with thread tangling, so I go for long, so I can sew as long as possible without stopping. We're gonna do a simple quilter's knot. Any knot is fine. I use this quilter's knot all the time. On my Kawandi pieces, I like to have my corners um, all the same color. As you can see, I've got three of the same color, one slightly different. I kind of set them aside to make sure that they're, you know, where I want them. I also have my pile of little squares that I've prepped. Often when I'm working, I don't prep my squares. I just cut them as I need them from my enormous stack of scraps. That I have next to me. However, because I'm teaching today, I do a little bit of prep. Prep or not is up to you. You can have little squares and rectangles and whatever set aside. Uh, I have a triangle too that I did press one side on. It depends on what is relaxing to you, what part of the process you enjoy. I don't really like ironing, so a lot of times I'll have my fabrics in their big pile. And I don't always start with squares because that's not what my scrap basket looks like. So I will cut, if I wanna use this piece, you know, I'll cut off these off cuts and leave them for when I'm feeling like playing with them. I'll take a square, press it, that's flat enough. And then I'll decide, am I gonna let the selvage be used or not? And then I may, when I'm ready to attach it to the quilt, I'll fold over one side and put it in. So pressing is not needed, um, but if you zone out pressing, then you do you. Um, so I've got my fabrics, I've got my pin cushion. Uh, it's important to me to have one that makes me smile. This is a Deb Fisher, Fish Museum and Circus pin cushion. And for my corners, I'm going to finger press only um, my sides. And each side is going to get pressed about half an inch. Um, mine, I can tell you mine always get pressed the same amount, most of them, because that is just what I do. And it's actually 5 eighths uh, of an inch, it doesn't really matter. But I wanna fold it in and I wanna make sure that I have it folded under enough that it's not going to come loose in the wash or with use. Um, because my Kawandi, despite the fact that they're little, they do get used. I have two little dogs and they like to play with the Kawandi. Um, 
I discourage digging on the Kiwandi because they can pull the stitches out, but if they want to snuggle on them or drag them around the house, that's fine. I like my dogs more than my quilts. So that's an important thing to know about me. All right, so I will just pin the first piece on and then I will start stitching. Uh, because I have the little dogs, I don't pin the whole edge. I don't plan out the process. This is a very meditative process. My Kiwandis for me happen in the moment. My fabric choices happen as I'm working. Um, for instance, you'll see that I've got blues, grays, and hot pink. When I started this morning, I was going to make one with just neutrals, but I started pulling all my neutral fabrics and then I thought that was boring and I added blue. And when I sat down to film, the pink said, I wanna play. And it's all fine. Um, it's whatever I feel like in the moment is what happens. So the spot that we start our Kawandi is kind of important, not urgent, you know, not like earth shattering, but I am going to start my stitches about a half an inch away from the corner. So I am going to hide my knot by running my needle between the layers of fabric and batting and then have it come out about an eighth of an inch away from the edge. And I'm gonna pull it through. I'm just gonna pull it until the knot is in there. I'm gonna give it a little tug to make sure the knot is really kind of seated and won't come loose later. And then I'm gonna start my stitches. Now I keep my stitches right on the edge. And my goal is to do a running stitch, like, you know, straight and along the edge. In reality, they're not very straight along the edge and that's okay. The most important part is that my stitches come through and that they seal up this edge. I don't want my batting leaking out later. So we're just gonna stitch down to the corner here and make sure that I've, you know, I'm going through the layers. And my thread always, always catches on the heads of the pins, which is another reason to not use a lot of pins. I have a habit whenever I get to one of these spots, let's see if you can see it, where this little kind of raw edge is here, I just kind of tuck that guy under with the tip of the needle and then take a few stitches. <clears throat> And then that one's fastened and it won't be peeping out on me later. Not that it really matters. It's not like it'll make the Kiwandi fall apart. I just don't like having the little loose threads sticking out. Despite the fact that I love this kind of loosey goosey um, technique, I do have little throwback uh, uptight issues on the quilting. So we'll see that I'm about an inch and a half away from the edge here. So I am going to set my needle down and get my next piece of fabric. And I'm going to take this one, the next one on the stack, fold under about a half an inch, and then I'm gonna lay it on here and see, is this where I want it to go? And I don't want it to go in that alignment. I want it to go that. Because I don't wanna have these fabrics form a line across the top. I wanna have kind of a jagged line. Uh, and that is a Jen Strouser issue. So then I'm going to place my second patch on top of the first one and again overlap by about half an inch. Replace my pin, get a second pin, and then keep stitching. And I am going to reach over and turn off my iron that is hissing and clicking because I'm done with the iron for the next little bit. That's actually all the ironing the Kiwandi gets at the beginning. There's no more, no more iron play today. So when you first start your first Kiwandi, this bit is the most, uh, the slowest part, the most tedious, I'm gonna actually just take this pin out to get it out of the way. It's gonna to continue to catch my thread and annoy me. Um, but this first row is the most tedious part of the process. After this, it's much more relaxing. I'm gonna pull my pin out and I'm gonna notice this little bit and I'm going to tuck it in again. And if you forget to do that, it doesn't matter. That is just me. Um, 
but the first row is the longest row. That's actually one of my favorite parts of making the kawandi is that every row is shorter than the one before it. So it goes faster and faster until you get to the middle. And then you're done. All right, so now I've done that piece. I'm gonna take the next scrap from my pile and actually I'll talk a little bit about the fabrics I have. Um, this one is called Mariner's Cloth. It was by um, Allison Glass. You see it has a kind of a nice finished selvage edge. I'm just gonna leave that on there exposed. And I'm gonna fold under about half an inch. Wait, actually, cause this one really kind of likes to fray. I'm gonna give it a little extra. And I'm gonna layer it. I'm gonna pin it in place. And I'm gonna make sure that it stays flat on the line here. And, okay, and then we're gonna stitch this one down. I like to use these, they're yarn dyed fabrics. And what that means is instead of going through the screen printing process, like most of our quilting cottons do, these are, um, the yarns or the threads that make up the fabric are dyed and then woven. So it's kind of softer and looser than a traditional uh, quilting cotton, which is more softer in my hands and more, um, it's easier to put the needle through. So it's just more pleasant to stitch with. So I use these pretty much exclusively when I am doing Kawandi by hand. When I do it by machine, I use a lot of batiks because those are my other favorite fabric. And I do not like hand stitching through batik. It is tight and tough. And I'd rather just save these for this. So that's what these fabrics are. And unfortunately, a lot of the ones that I have are out of print because of the way fabric manufacturing works. Um, things go out of print quickly and I have a large collection going back many, many years. Um, all right. so back to the technique. I am going to fold over my next corner. So it's, I'm not quite ready to stitch that part down yet, but for planning purposes, we're going to attach the corner here. And just the same way as before, just line it up and pin it down. And then I'm going to look at this gap here because this is what I need to cover up. And you'll notice that all of my pieces previous to this I have folded this side and then stitched this side and then stitched. I can do that again. And again, I have a nice finished selvage, so I'm gonna leave that here, but, and I'm gonna have the stripes go this way. So I'm going to fold under one side here, count my selvage as finished edge, and then I'm gonna fold over another side so that I have three finished edges. Um, and let's see, and that is actually not quite large enough. So I'm going to just set it aside and grab a different piece. Let's see, was this one wider? Yeah, this one's a little wider, wider enough. And you'll notice I keep just throwing the threads that are loose on my desk. Uh, they're just inside the Kawandi. They'll get covered up and they can stay there and that's fine. They don't need to be pulled off or anything. They can just live inside and be extra batting. All right, so I wanna make sure that both sides overlap at least half an inch and that's good. So this one's gonna go here. Um, you get to decide with every single piece of fabric that you add, do I want this one on top? Do I want this one on top? Because this one you could put on and fold under and have everybody going the same way. I almost always um, have my corners underneath everything else. Um, for no reason, that's just how I like to do it. I like the corners to recede into the background a little bit. So now I've got that. So my whole first side is there. And it looks a little chaotic. I'm not spending, because I'm talking and teaching, I'm not spending the time I often would on composition and color flow. A lot of times I will look at my fabrics 
and decide which ones want to hang out next to each other. Uh, today I'm going to be a little bit more random. When I'm doing this as more of a meditation relaxation, I spend a lot more time considering how the fabrics will interact with each other. Although even when it, you do it randomly, it's kind of fun because this fabric is supposed to be a blue, I think, but when it's next to these other blues, it really looks so gray. It looks a little bit more blue here next to the gray. So I think that's interesting to watch the colors interact with each other. And a lot of my fabrics have very saturated colors like these pinks. So they'll do some interesting uh, vibrations and stuff next to each other. Okay, so this is basically it now as we go around. Um, we're going to go all the way around and come back. So I'll speed up the video. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about fabrics. So the wovens, I have the mariner's cloth. I have this, I think this is some kind of K-facet shot cotton. It's very lightweight compared to this one. They all work beautifully together in the quilt. I've not had any problems. I have this kind of, this is called Canvas Boro Slub by Moda. Um, it's much thicker. It is luscious to stitch through. I love it. I have very little bit of that left. The other one I really like is Essex Linen, which is a little bit rougher, and it's a cotton linen blend. You can use 100% linen if you have it. Essex, I think I've shown you this already, has fun, the selvages are always interesting because they just use the empty thread rolls or almost empty thread rolls that are left to fill out their warp threads. So the selvage often gets left on with these and I'll, you know, pull out these and trim it up a little bit, but I'll leave the selvages exposed because they're so pretty. But anything that you like, like this is peppered cotton, this is some other brand of shot cotton, any fabric is fine. I happen to love the yarn dyes. They're just so much more subtle and fun. And I pick them up when I shop for fabric. I often just feel the fabric. The, the way that it feels is more important than the way that it looks to me a lot of times now. Um, I also have this Manchester embroidered cotton, which has these little crosses on it. This is really fun to work with. However, if you have little pets, these jumps can get pulled. So just be aware that it may not be, it may be something that weathers a little bit differently than you had anticipated if it's a fabric that's gonna get, or if it's a piece that's gonna get used um, by small dogs or children. So I'm gonna keep stitching. Okay, so just a quick demonstration of what I do when it's time to end my thread. I take out the pin, bring the thread back in between the layers, and this time I'm actually gonna go here so that I'm close to the batting. So my stitches just look normal and they come to the batting. Take a little stitch in the batting and then tie a knot. That is it. And now the knot is hidden inside of the quilt. And I'm going to put on another length of thread. It's very easy to hide knots the whole time you're working on the Kiwandi. The only thing I will say is that for some reason, I always tend to run out on a corner. And corners can be a little tricky to get around because you know, you see it's, it's not so accessible in there. But even then, it's never that big of a deal to figure out where to stop and start. So I'm just gonna bring my needle back to inside of the Kiwandi in between the layers bring my needle back out. So as if the stitch line never stopped, pull through, make sure that my needle, or that my knot is in there somewhere. It's got a bunch of extra threads. And then I'm gonna continue. So that is how you end and restart your threads. Uh, just keep burying, hiding stuff between the layers. Never forget that you have access to the middle to make it really easy to hide your knots. We are almost back to the starting point. So it's taken me a little while. I can't quite read what the camera says. Uh, I think it's about 40 minutes to go all the way around the outer edge. Um, if this is your first time, it should take you longer than that. Um, even if it's just for my pride. 
Uh, one thing I will notice, well, I will mention if you noticed, I didn't turn this fabric under. I decided to leave it underneath so that everybody else on top was turned under. That's because this fabric is really thick and it makes kind of a big lump when I fold it. So if I minimize the folding of that piece, I'm gonna just enjoy the, enjoy it a little bit better. So it's still in there and I love it, but I try not to fold it too much. Um, let's see. So as you come along, right to where you started, we are just going to continue going around and around. And I, I wanna say circles, but we're going in squares, um, but in concentric, a spiraling square. So we're just gonna come back to here, and of course my thread is running short again, because it likes to run out in the corners, you'll remember I told you. And it doesn't matter if I try shorter lengths or longer lengths, I always run out in the corners. It's like Murphy's Law. Uh, so I'm just gonna finish off here. And let's see. All right. I'm going to take one more stitch this way, and then I'm just going to turn the corner. Actually, I'm going to do it like a stab stitch because when you're at the corners here in particular, so that each corner has a lot of layers. There's the back, there's the batting, then there's the folded bits. So like right over here, there's a lot of layers. But now we're just, we came to the corner and we're just gonna turn and keep going. And what this does is it makes, it, when you start a half an inch away, it gives you this really nice straight turn. When I learned initially, I just started wherever and you'd have to kind of do a little diagonal and grade it out. But this way, if you start here, you just turn and you have a nice Thing. This took me like 10, 10 pieces to figure that out. All right, so this next row goes much faster because now we're just going to stitch along our line and I am going to use my pins and I'm just going to use two. I try never to have too many going in my piece at once because they will fall out and I have little dogs and I'm paranoid about my little dogs getting a pin in their foot. Um, so I like to keep my rows of stitches a half an inch or less uh, apart. This actually looks like it might be a little bit wide, wider than usual, but that's okay. Um, I just don't want to have really big rows of stitching. I like them actually really, really tight, but it takes a long time to finish a kawandi that way. Um, so a little bit wider is better. My stitches are usually about an eighth of an inch long. Uh, there's no right or wrong. I think a little bit longer is better because this is like a big stitch quilting. Um, I tend to end up with smaller and smaller stitches as I go along and I have to rem remind myself to make bigger stitches just because I, you know, I done some traditional hand quilting with the teensy weensy stitches and I kind of automatically go back to that. Um, that rhythm, but I like to do the big stitches on the Kiwandi. I think the graphic nature of the big stitches is just so attractive here. Uh, let's see, what else? I, I use colored threads in my pieces. Traditionally, they are made with white threads. Um, I find white thread to be boring, so I don't use white thread. Uh, I use all different colors and I don't I don't use one color of thread. I use variegated and I have three or four spools at least in each quilt and I will change as desired. All right, let's look at this next piece here. I would say that this piece I probably could get away with going one more round before adding another piece of fabric. But we're going to do this now anyway. It's important not to skimp on your fabric. You don't want to make your uh, overlaps too small because then when sometimes when you use or wash the Kiwandi, it'll scoot and you'll get a hole and holes are not desirable. Um, holes are easier to repair by adding another patch, but you know, why not just do a little full, you know, 
be generous with your fold overs and overlaps and you won't have to deal with the holes. So I'm gonna take another piece of fabric and I'm just going to do my two edges that I need and fold those over. And then I'm gonna place it on top and I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look and say, this is where my line of stitches is and I'm going to line it up so that the edge is gonna be right there in that line of stitches. Now you can use a, long, a wider piece and make it go like this and so that you have more of interest, more different weird shapes. Since this piece is the size that it is, I'm just gonna line it up here and it's gonna fit under that nicely or it's gonna fit over this one nicely and we just want to cover up this lighter blue that's in the base here. And that guy will cover it up, that edge. So just make sure that as you come along, you know, it's better to always put the piece of fabric on a little bit early than too late. So that's all I'm going to do. And I'm going to stitch over there. So the other thing I will say is that I don't spend a lot of time planning what's going to happen further along in the quilt. I like the process to be a little bit more organic and happen in the moment. And I don't like to agonize over decisions. I just like to make them and move on. Um, so I don't think about what's going to happen later. I solve the puzzles as they are presented to me. Not everybody likes to work that way, um, but that's how I do it. So I'm always like, you know, working like two pins ahead. That's all I look at. When you start getting towards the middle and things start to overlap, um, it does get a little bit more planned, but not by too much. But we'll be there shortly.